Salvate the Omnes, and welcome to the first section of the Aeneid 2 verse literature for the GCC. I'll go quite fast, hit the video. Um, I'm going to try not to give all of the background information in the first video. Um, these videos may end up being slightly longer anyway, just because the verse literature tends to be in slightly larger chunks, but it will be death if I give you a huge backstory, but nonetheless. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to reference the Iliad a fair amount. Um, I will also put in the description of the video a link to some videos that sort of explain it or give a summary. Um, the very, very short version um, is here. <laughs> That's what happens in the Iliad. Um, everyone in the ancient world, in Greece and Rome, would know it to at least some extent. So Virgil is going to be very much writing with an awareness of the Iliad. Virgil himself was born in 70 BC, he's, he's Italian, um, which means that he lived through several civil wars, which obviously has an impact upon his writing. He wrote three major poetic works, the Eclogues, which are about herdsmen and pastoral scenes, the Georgics, which are about farming, and the Aeneid, which is the important bit for us, the Aeneid is the story of this dude, Aeneas, who is the son of Anchises, a, the ruler of Dardania, which was near to Troy, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love. That makes him a fairly significant demigod. He turns up in the Iliad. He is a second cousin to Prince Hector. Um, he's actually married to Hector's sister, Creusa. She's going to come up in a bit. Um, he is a fairly significant fighter, although he doesn't actually do particularly well in the Iliad itself, but he's, his main sort of facet is that he survives. He is going to live and lead away the refugees um, to found a new nation in Italy. Um, not that they know where Italy is at the moment, but that's what he's going to go do. Um, so the Aeneid is the story about how they get there. It actually opens up in Carthage. Um, he meets Queen Dido, who is the ruler of the Carthaginians, and for two books, two and three, are about him narrating how they got from fall, from the fall of Troy to Carthage. Uh, our bits in book two, which is basically part of the fall of Troy, uh, that actually includes the Trojan horse, but we don't do that in our bit. Um, after he narrates how they got there, he is told to leave by Jupiter because he's got a destiny of, you know, going and setting up Rome. Not that not that he actually sets up Rome. That's actually left to his descendants, Romulus and Remus. He sets up a nation which will eventually, maybe along the lines, become Rome, but whatever. Uh, he does so, abandoning Dido, who commits suicide. Um, just because they were sort of married. A bit complicated. Uh, more shenanigans on the way. They eventually arrive in Italy and the locals are not okay with this. And there's a war because... Yeah, um, and eventually Aeneas kills their local king um, and basically says, yay, now we live here. Aeneas here is leading his young son Iulus, hence the Julian family. I'm going to reference that later. Uh, probably not this video, though. Um, Anchises is his father who he is carrying, and the Anchises himself is carrying the Penates. I'll talk about them later as well. Into the Latin. And perhaps you might ask, requiras being a presence conjunctive, what the fate of Priam was, or more literally what the fates of Priam were, but what the fate of Priam was. When he saw the fall of the having been captured city, Capti being a PPP, and the having been torn open, again, perfect, another perfect passive participle, the having been torn open entrances of the houses, and the, literally the middle enemy in the inner chambers. Um, you can see why it's been translated here. Um, this is a nice example of something called hyperlarge, where a word um, grammatically describes something that it logically describes else, um, fitting the clumsy helmets in Dulcea Decorum Est. Um, obviously the helmets aren't clumsy, it's the people who are acting clumsy because of their, of their haste but a, a nice sort of technical term there we can mention. The old man puts around Kirkundat, uh, puts the armour, his arms, which have been de abandoned, diu iwu, 
Dear is for a long time. Ivum is an age. So, and it's just ablative here. So, literally, for a long time in time. So, just long. Long abandoned. On his trementis umeris. On his trembling soldiers. Nequiquam. In vain. That word, that, that theme of being useless and in vain is going to come up a lot in, our, in this set text. You may be wondering, um, Priam is the king of Troy. I hope I've mentioned that. Um, more importantly, at this stage, he is old. He is the old man. He has several, he has a lot, in fact, of strong, you know, powerful sons um, who basically all just died off in this war in one way or another. Um, and, and it's almost, almost, him alone at this stage. So he's trembling soldiers. Nice imagery of the sort of the old man trying to put on this armour. And the inutile, the useless iron or sword, literally is belted on, but he belts on the useless iron or sword. And he carries himself, literally is carried, but he carries himself, Moratorus, being a future participle, about to die, into the thick enemy, literally, in, into the dense enemy, uh, into the thick of the enemy in English. Um, if you were thinking, by the way, of the armour, um, the Hittites are not entirely quite the Trojans, but they're pretty close. Um, and you can sort of see here, this is uh, what a Hittite commander might have been wearing, again up here. Um, this is something called the Dendra Panopoly, this guy here who looks a bit like a Christmas tree, um, which was some version of armour found. They have the big shield. Um, you may be noticing that ferrum, obviously related uh, to the, the chemical terms nowadays, um, technically means iron. These guys were not iron wearing iron, they were wearing bronze. Um, but Virgil will use modern terms to describe the ancient warfare, Partially as an anachronism to make it more immediate, and partially because he, they probably didn't know exactly what they were using. This was quite a while ago. There you go. Uh, oh, and another version of the same sort of thing. Um, we have here, I think this is actually meant to be Agamemnon himself, um, with some of his commanders. This guy is on a horse. He should not be on a horse. They did not even have saddles at this stage. Saddles were a much later invention. Um, but they did have chariots. Chariots were used. And here we have a couple of Trojan commanders. Um, again, obviously A, they're wearing bronze, um, not iron. And B, you can sort of see um, the, the Luwian Trojans don't actually look that much like the Greeks, but both of them are going to act, well, actually they're going to act Latin, as we will see. In the middle halls, in the middle of the halls, and lovely poetic phrase here, under the nudo, under the naked axis of the sky. Um, I see in the translation saying, under the naked vault of heaven. Lovely, very pretty, but um, basically in the open air. Um, was through it a ingens ara, a huge altar, and yuxta nearby a very old laurel. Uh, laurel being fourth dimension here. Leaning on the altar, and having him covered, literally, um, having embraced, um, we're going to translate this as a present participle. Not that uncommon, actually, for a perfect active participle to be translated as a present participle. And covering the penates with shade. Incidentally, speaking of shade, there is a little bit of shade uh, being thrown here um, upon the god Apollo. This tree, the laurel tree, is sacred to him. Priam, the king, is about to, spoilers, be murdered on an altar underneath a laurel tree, and Apollo, who has for a long time been a supporter and protector of Troy, and indeed was the one, was the very person who helped kill Achilles, him and him and Paris killed Achilles, isn't going to do anything. Not right now, he's going to let whatever happens, happens. And as we see, it's not good for Priam. The Penates were... Um, slightly complicated, but basically the personal gods of a family, although the state would also have a version, and they are very important for the Romans. Um, and Aeneas, well, one of the things he does is he carries the Penates from Troy to Italy. Um, and indeed, in some tradition, they're the literal objects. But why are the Trojans, who are not at all Roman, they're not Greek even, they're, they're related to the, to the Hittites, 
um, a fairly Asiatic kind of race. Um, why on earth are they speaking Latin and using Roman tradition like the Penates? As we saw, the Iron Virgil's going to do that a lot. Here, remember, Hick can mean here. Here, Hecuba and her daughters, uselessly, again, this word, were sitting around the altar. Like cow, like doves fleeing or headlong. The word fleeing isn't there, but headlong is um, from a atra, from a black tempestate, from a black storm. Um, moving on. Um, close together and embracing the simulacra, the images of the gods. Uh, we're treating Amplexa despite the fact, Amplexa despite the fact it is a perfect active participle, we're going to translate it as a present participle. As I say, it happens not that uncommonly. Um, this middle line is a really nice example of something called an epic simile. Very, very common in Homer. Virgil therefore likes to do it as well. Um, Originally, the idea, I suppose, behind these was you were comparing a relatively difficult situation to visualise with a situation that would be very common for a reader. So in, in, in Homer, we have soldiers who are compared to animals, therefore um, the, the, the someone who can more easily visualise what that might look like. You know, Ajax is compared to a a lion who is being attacked by hunters and he sort of fends them off and none of them want to get too close and it's very easy to see how that might work. Um, Virgil's kind of doing this, I suppose, the same sort of thing. Um, think about how doves fleeing before a storm are. Do they have any hope whatsoever of affecting a storm? Obviously no. All they can do is flee before it and hope not to get absolutely murdered and they're probably going to get murdered by the storm. Here, was a, what, what does this say about Hecuba and her daughters, if they're like doves fleeing before a storm? It's not going to be a good situation for them. However, Autem, when, remember ut plus the indicative can mean when or as, when she saw Priam himself with the armies, the arms of a young man equipped, she said, all the way down here, what thought, um, <laughs> what thought or mind so dire or dreadful, O oh, most miserable husband? Remember, we can always talk about superlatives. Has driven brackets you to belt on these weapons? Uh, Kingi is literally passive infinitive, but we're going to translate treat it as if it were active. Or literally, or to where are you rushing? The tempus, the time, does not need. Um, egeo is a slightly weird verb. Um, it takes the ablative as its object. So the time does not need such help, nor those defenders. Um, iste is a really quite negative word. It's, it's Personally, I always visualise it as someone like pointing, shaking their finger at someone. It's usually quite a negative word. So what does this say if Hecuba is like, there is no point. We don't need this kind of help. We don't need that kind of defence pointing at the weapons that Priam is wearing. No, not if my Hector himself were now nunc present. Um, add for it being a bit weird. Please. Tandem is being translated here as please. It doesn't normally mean that. It normally means finery at last, but here is basically what it means. Um, concede, concede, literally. Come cook to here. Um, concede has the same sort of connotations in English as it does in Latin. If you concede your position, you are both physically withdrawing and also like giving up. You, know, you concede the advantage. And that kind of has the same connotations in Latin. She wants Priam to give up his defence and also to physically concede, as in come over here. This altar will protect us all, or you will die at the same time, brackets, as us, or together with us. Cheerful note. Having spoken, um, fator is a deponent verb, so effator, when she had uttered 
thus sick from her mouth. Nice example of a pleonism. Um, when you speak from your mouth, that's kind of what the word means. She withdrew the old man, the long-aged man, look, longus Ivum, long-aged man, to herself, and placed him on the sede, on the seat, but the sacred seat, the sacred seat. I'm presuming here on the altar, in some respect, um, or maybe the throne next to the altar. And that is the whole section. Immediately, a lot of foreshadowing coming up in our section, Priam's trying to put on his gear and notice you know, words about in vain, useless, he's about to die. Um, it, it's not a happy section, and, and the, the bit about the, the doves fleeing for the black storm is again very much foreshadowing bad things are going to happen to Priam. Hope that helps. Thank you very much.